in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. With all what is going around us right now in this culture, uh, regarding the sexual immorality that the culture is approving and the culture is also uh, advocating. That's why we as Sunday school servants, we need to have a Christian understanding of sexuality. This actually will help us with ourselves and with our marriage for those who are married and also help us to guide our children in Sunday school when they are confused with what the culture is teaching or struggling with some uh, sexual sins. So let me start by asking a question. Which one God created first, hunger or food? Meaning, did God create man as a hungry being and then he created the food in order to satisfy his hunger or the opposite? God created first the food and then he created the man and gave the person appetite to and pleasure to eat the food and to enjoy it and made this food a way to survive in life. And all of this should turn at the end into thanksgiving to God. We thank him because he provided us with the food. Usually, in marketing, the people creating the need first. And then, after they create the need, then they offer the solution. And thus, everyone will go for this solution. They create a problem, and then after they create the problem and make sure everyone has this need, then they give the solution so everyone actually will get the solution. But God is exactly the opposite. God create good gifts as we read in James, every good gift is coming from above, from the Lord. Then God give us the pleasure or the appetite or the need. It's not the opposite. It's not he's creating the need and then there is no satisfaction for this need. Then he will give us a solution. So, when we speak about sexuality, God actually created sexuality because sexuality has a very unique attractivity power. Attractivity power. That can attract the husband to his wife and the wife to her husband. Also, when we speak about sexuality, God created sexuality to be more than the sum of its parts. What do I mean by the sum of its part, more than the sum of its part? To understand this, let us think about cake. Cake is made from flour, milk, egg. 
But when we mix these together, we'll have a delicious cake. So the cake in itself is more the sum of just flour and milk and egg. In the same way, sexuality is not body organs and hormones, but sexuality goes beyond this, beyond what is physical. Sexuality actually involves our emotions and our spirituality. In sexuality, in the sacrament of marriage, the two become one, one flesh. And they are united together through the sexual union. And to honor sexuality, God actually made the union between a husband and wife like the union between God and his people. That's why when the people of God worship idols, God called this adultery, spiritual adultery. They are cheating on God. So God honored sexuality and likened it to the union between God and his people. Sexuality also is very powerful. And like, can you imagine running river with a strong current of waves? If there is no boundaries, it can cause flood. In the same way, because his sexuality is so powerful, that's why God made firm boundaries. Otherwise, if we removed these boundaries, like what's happening right now in our culture, unfortunately, and in the whole world, this power will be destructive power. So what God gave us to enjoy so we may praise him, what gave us to participate with him in creation can be very destructive if we crossed the boundaries of sexuality. And since God is the one who created sexuality, then he has every right to tell us what are the boundaries. And any violation to these boundaries is violation against God himself. One of the boundaries is no sex outside the sacramental marriage. And sexuality cannot be shared with others, either before marriage or during marriage, to share it with another person other than the spouse. That's why we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28, you have heard it was said in the past, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, he who looks at a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery in his heart. Another boundary that we should not trigger sexuality or flirt with sexuality 
until the right time comes. Otherwise, this power will be a destructive power to the person himself. And we know that some youth suffer under this slavery of sexuality because they triggered it and flirt with it before the proper time. The third boundary that sexuality could be, should be practiced regularly with agreement between husband and wife. And the Bible made it very clear that it is not right for the husband or wife to prevent the other person his or her right, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That's before the marriage. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let, let each woman have her own husband. Then, let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her. And likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And the likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Then you don't have authority over your own body, even before marriage. This authority, God gave it to your wife or your future wife. So don't trigger sexuality before marriage. And the authority was given to the wife or to the man, not to the person himself. Then St. Paul said very clearly, do not deprive one another. That's a boundary. Do not deprive one another, except with consent for a time, not always, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again come together again. And if you don't do this, you will be tempted by Satan. So that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. That's another boundary. All these boundaries, not to deprive us from our freedom, but to support our freedom. As I told you, the water in a river, if, it's not, if there is no two banks, it will turn into flood. So these boundaries is to protect the free running of the water. In the same way, the boundaries that God made to sexuality to protect our freedom, not to eliminate it. As I told you, sexuality is very powerful. Without boundaries, it will be very destructive. And as I said in the beginning, it is a gift from God. When we use sexuality as intended by God, we'll be joyful. We'll feel that we are free. But when we abuse this gift, then it will be a destructive force in our life. So God granted sexuality to the couple, to the married couple, as a unique way through which they know each other well. That's why the biblical term for the sexual intimacy 
is knowledge. When you read like in Genesis chapter uh, 4, and Adam knew his wife. Knew means he became intimate with her. Why? Because through sexuality, each one will know the other in a deeper way. Because as I told you, sexuality is more than the sum of its parts. Also, in sexuality, from a Christian perspective, it is to serve one another is to please one another, not to focus on my satisfaction. That's why God gives the authority to the other person. So this person will please that person and this person will please that person. Also, in sexuality, it is time of vulnerability in front of each other. So, in sexuality, both of them, they become vulnerable to one another. Also in sexuality, it's opportunity to give and to receive. To give love and respect and to receive love and respect. In our life, we need to give and to receive. If we don't give, then we are not loving, we are not generous. If we don't receive, then we are arrogant, we are prideful. So, in our life, we need to give and to receive. There is no other activity between the couple that can provide all of this to know one another, to serve one another, to be vulnerable with one another, to give and receive except in sexuality. That's why when sexuality is abused in marriage or outside marriage, there is a big loss. But when sexuality is used as intended by God, this actually will bond the couple together. Unfortunately, pornography deprives sexuality from all these beautiful meaning. Pornography objectify the person, make the person as the object of pleasure, or of pleasure. Many Christian theologians try to reach to the deeper meaning of sexuality. Some of them said sexuality is just a symbol uh, of the union between God and his church to explain to us the, the pleasure of our union with God. Yes, we know that sexuality is good because it is created by a good God. And sexuality is good in its essence. And as I said, the meaning or the purpose of sexuality is beyond just pleasure and beyond the mutual satisfaction. But it actually can make the couple united together in a very unique way. That's why 
the Lord said, man leaves his wife, his father and mother, and cleave to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. When he said one flesh, referring to the sexual intimacy. And this union is made by God. What God united together, no man can separate. It was actually in God's ability to make sexuality just an activity to the couple without the pleasure so it will not have this power of attractivity. But God didn't do this. And he made sexuality is extremely pleasurable. And if you compare sexuality with any other pleasure, you will find that the sexuality is more than any other pleasure. Uh, and why God intended this? Because this pleasure will bring the couple together in a strong union. When we understand that the ultimate goal of sexuality is the union and the oneness, the two shall become one flesh, then we now understand why sexuality should be only and only between a husband and wife. Now we can understand why God made sexuality before marriage is sinful. And sexuality outside marriage is adultery. And sexuality with oneself like masturbation made it sinful because it is selfish. A person just seek his own pleasure. Where is the union here between two? When the, where is the giving and, and receive? That's why premarital sex, adultery, masturbation, sexual immorality, all of this give a false meaning to the true sexuality. It is abuse of this go good gift that God granted us, the gift of sexuality. Also, as I said, God gave us the gift and then he created the need in us. The need is what we call a desire. So when God created sexuality, he created in us the sexual desire. And some youth who are not yet married they actually tempted because there is a sexual desire inside them, but we tell them you, can, you cannot use it right now. If you use it, it is sin, it is abuse. And they ask this question, why God give me this desire? And then he tells me, don't use it. And many of them actually suffer under this desire as a heavy burden. Some people say the purpose of the sexual desire is only for procreation because the sexual desire bring the couple together, then they can have children. 
Yes, I can say the biological purpose of sexuality is procreation. But this is not everything. Let's compare it with another desire, the desire for food. Yes, the biological purpose of food is to be healthy and to grow. And yes, some people, they fall in gluttony and they eat more than what they need biologically to be healthy. And some people also may need less, may eat less than what they need. And their health will get affected. But when you compare the sexuality with the desire to food, you will find that sexual desire is more than the biological need. For food, the desire for food more or less mean, meets our need. But when it comes to the sexual desire, it is more than just for procreation. Because if the sexual desire, only the purpose of the sexual desire, just procreation, then any couple will need to have sexual intimate relationship few times until they have two or three children and that's it. Otherwise, uh, they will have many children Again, another question about the sexual desire. If the sexual desire is a result of the sin of Adam and Eve, that's why we need to suppress it? Definitely not. Because how God gave us sexuality and we call that the sexual desire is the result of sin. So the sexual desire is legitimate before God. So God gave us the sexual desire, as I said, because through this sexual desire, the full union with his wife will be fulfilled. And as, and, and the Bible, that's why as I read to you in First Corinthians chapter seven, he did not say that the couple should have sexual desire until they have children and then no more sexual uh, intimacy. But the Bible says they should continue in their sexual relationship together. Only they abstain to consecrate certain time for prayer and fasting. Other, th other than this, their sexual intimate relationship continues. And that's why God gives the authority to the other person. And since God gives the authority to the other person, it's called, as St. Paul said, do not deprive one another from this right. This sexuality will keep them in love and unity.
So I can say sexuality is an essential part in the relationship between the husband and wife. And this sexual desire before marriage motivates the person and encourage the person to seek a wife and to marry her and live together in the fear of God, in unity. This sexual desire after marriage will actually make the husband or the wife to seek his or her spouse. And this actually can resolve any problem between the both of them. Uh, without this sexual desire, it would be very easy for the couple to avoid their responsibility toward one another. And in this way, the union will dissolve between the couple. They will be like uh, persons just uh, living together, but there is no union. What about the youth who are struggling under this desire? God wants us to be a strong and disciplined people. How to discipline our body, as St. Paul said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. So the body does not control me, the desires of the body does not control me, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. That's why God said this desire should only be fulfilled in marriage. So I want to, to tell you clearly, to have this desire in itself is not sinful. But to abuse the desire, is, it is sinful. Because some youth, when they feel the desire, they feel they are sinful. No, the desire is good. If you don't feel hungry, you will never eat. And if we don't eat, we will die. So God gave us this hunger pain so we may eat and live. In the same way, if we don't have the sexual desire, why a person would consider marriage? And if we don't consider marriage, or even people who are married, they don't have actually a sexual intimate relationship, the marriage will die. Die because there is no union. It will be just partners living together. So the sexual desire is given to us as a gift from God, not to suppress it, but to use it within the right boundaries. Uh, and for the youth, when you feel this desire, inside you. You, you. you need to discipline your body not to fall into masturbation or pornography or premarital sex. This actually should encourage you to discipline your body and then in the right time to seek a godly wife to marry her in the fear of God.
when God actually granted us the sexual desire, he did not grant it to male and females in the same way. But they are different in their sexual desire. The sexual desire is stronger in males regarding the physical part. And why God give it stronger to men more than women? So actually, even in the sexual intimate relationship, the man should take the role of leadership. Uh, so God gave a greater desire to men so they should be leaders even when it comes to sexuality. They should be the initiators and many wives they complain that men without showing respect or love, they demand the sexual relationship. If we understood what explained about how sexuality is to serve one another, to focus on the other, not on the person itself, it's not a selfish act, it is a giving act. If we understand all of this, then actually men should initiate the love and the respect toward their uh, wives. So when I'm speaking about leadership here, I'm not speaking leadership in giving orders and wives say, yes, sir. I'm not speaking about this. But they should be leaders in offering the love, in offering the respect, in offering the service to others. That's what God did with us. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. God became our leader and our head when he died on the cross for us, when he served us, when he loved us, even when we are sinners. That is the leadership. Another difference between men and women, men feel the intimacy and the acceptance during the sexual intimate relationship. But women, they experience the intimacy and acceptance before the sexual relationship. And when they feel they are accepted and they are loved, then the sexual relationship comes as a fruit. And this is a big difference. And again, God intended this. So men who had the desire, they start by satisfying the emotional needs of his wife first, making her feel loved, respected, accepted. If he is the leader, then he should offer all of this. And since God gave him the greater sexual desire, this will help him to offer this. So God actually even granted men with the tools to be able to offer this. Then, when she feels loved, respected, and accepted, she will satisfy his need in the relationship itself. 
So we can see here a connection between the sexual desire and the leadership in men. We cannot separate them from each other. If the opposite was the case, if God gave the women the greater desire and made her the leader, then the husband would not be interested or motivated to seek his wife and to uh, show her the love and respect. And God actually in sexuality made the desire in men no one else can satisfy this desire except the wife. And because of this, then he will take the initiative to show her the love and respect and the acceptance. In this way, his needs will be satisfied. I want you to see how God or Frustrated everything in a very beautiful way to make sure that the love and unity between the couple will continue all their life. But unfortunately, when we let the sexual immorality outside the church, outside the Christian understanding of sexuality, corrupt our mind. That's why many families are suffer from sexuality because they don't understand sexuality as intended by God. So the man as a leader, he satisfies the needs of his wife first. And as a result, she will satisfy his needs. And then we can see this actually make the bond between of, over them, uh, between both of them, very strong, and they will be blessed more than we can imagine. So God gives the leadership to the husband, and I explained leadership means to serve, to love, to respect, to accept. That's the leadership. And God actually called the, the wife to submit to the leadership. But as St. Peter said, we ought to obey God more than men. So the wife is called by God to challenge this leadership if her husband asked her something against her conscience or the commandment of God. And this is the responsibility of both the husband and the wife. The husband should not ask his wife to do something against the law of God. And the responsibility of the wife is to refuse to do anything against the, the law of God. For the husband, he should lead in a way that does not make his wife to reject him. Uh, if you are a leader, then you need actually to lead in a way that does not push the people away, but to let them submit to you. So the husband should lead in a way that 
do not let the, does not let the wife to reject him. Also, as a leader, he should be sensitive to her needs and to her desires. Also, he should be sensitive to certain times in which, for a reason or another, it is difficult for her to be with him in a relationship. And he should not compel her or force her to do this against her own will. A leader should not do this. That's why a husband should present example in leadership as a servant. And as I told you, the Lord himself, he became head to the church because he came to serve humanity. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And even in leadership, they say the best style of leadership is the servant leadership. As a leader, his thoughts and his heart is centered around his wife, not the opposite, not about himself. How to please her, his wife, not how to please himself. Also, as a leader, he should not be forceful or the opposite, he should not be so weak and, and uh, submissive. Because this actually is abuse of the leadership. He cannot be forceful and controller and also he should not be weak in his leadership. Uh, of course, there is a debate between whether Adam and Eve uh, had sexual relationship before the fall or not. I'm not go going to go into this debate, but if we assume that they had sexual relationship before the fall, Eve was the center of Adam's thoughts, and the opposite is true. So if Adam uh, was thinking about Eve, then definitely Eve did not reject Adam. But after the fall, when Adam started to think about himself, how to be similar to God, not thinking about his wife. And when Eve start to rebel against the leadership of Adam, and she wants to be the leader, that's when the sexual relationship between the husband and wife turn it into conflict instead of being uh, something pleasurable increase the unity between the husband and the wife. In family counseling, we find that many, many problems uh, between couples because of sexuality. And this is due to the absence of Christian understanding of sexuality. When I say Christian understanding, I mean sexuality according to the will of God who created sexuality and placed the sexual desire in us. So can we see here 
how the beautiful gift that God granted humanity became the source of conflict and problems between couples. This is exactly what Satan wants. Uh, Satan wants to torture humanity. And definitely, Satan doesn't want a human being to enjoy their life or to have pleasure in their lives. So Satan made the pleasure to be a goal, not a mean. Big, big difference when the goal is unity and the pleasure in sexuality is the means to make me reach this goal or the pleasure to be the goal. So Satan played with the mind of the people to make pleasure in sexuality is the goal. And in this way, he persuaded people to practice sex before marriage, outside the marriage, with oneself, pornography. And this is his plan, to make people practice sex outside marriage as much as they can and as less as they can in marriage. And thus he will make sure to destroy the families. The plan of Satan is to make us blind to the true purpose of sexuality <coughs> and make the pleasure in sexuality just a physical action. As I told you, it goes beyond the physical element. It involves our emotions and our spirituality. And that's why now Satan is proposing different type of sexuality, pornography, masturbation, homosexuality, transgenderism, all these types in order actually to destroy the family and thus destroying humanity and in this way uh, he make this gift, beautiful gift that God gave us to work against us instead of working for us to fulfill the economy and the law of God. I'll stop here and be me next time يعني, in the servant meeting next time in Nashville can I speak about uh, pornography. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.